So today we're in a pretty famous psalm, but we're, we're not really going to be spending any real time on the famous part of the psalm, but on the less famous part of the psalm. Psalm 139. I uh, bless you. You may uh, recognize that psalm as the, uh, you know, one of the kind of key psalms in the pro-life movement. You know, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Really wonderful, beautiful picture of the intimacy of a creator God in every aspect of our lives from conception. Uh, today we're just going to be looking at the first, or primarily at the first 11 verses of this psalm. I'm going to look at just another snapshot of the magnificence of God. So that as we're looking at the year, <clears throat> we're starting to build the year on the foundation of God's glory, of God's goodness, and of God's love for us. So let me read it for you. Uh, this is Psalm 139 from verse 1. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it. Lord, you've encircled me. You've placed your hand on me. This wondrous knowledge is beyond me. It's lofty. I'm unable to reach it. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is the place of the dead, the dirt, the earth, you are there. If I fly on the wings of the dawn and settle on the western horizon, even there your hand would lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be my night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are all alike to you. Let's pray again. We'll ask God for, for help. Father, again, we need your help. We don't want to just be uh, built up with knowledge. We want to be or, or puffed up with knowledge. We want to be built up in love, in understanding of you and your greatness and your character and what that means for us. And so help us as we search your scriptures today that you would make yourself more known to us, more evident among us, more alive in our life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. So uh, just the first 12, chapter, first 12 verses of this chapter uh, <clears throat> stand to, I mean, if you read with a particular kind of perspective, you read the first few verses and you think, well, that's actually a pretty scary thought. God, you know, all of my thoughts, all of my ways, I can't escape you anywhere. Wherever I go, your hand's on me. If that hand is a all-powerful being, like totally volitional, does whatever he wants being, and you are the enemy of that being, this is a terrifying psalm. Where can I go? Nowhere. Can't go high, can't go low, can't go east, can't go west, can't escape, can't hide in the dark. I can't go anywhere. You know everything about me, my motivations, where I'm going to go, my movements, everything, and your hand is upon me. Yikes. But if this is also an all-powerful, purely volitional being who loves you, this is an incredibly powerful psalm. Highlights God's knowledge, highlights his presence, highlights his power, and it highlights his holiness. We will touch on some of the rest of the psalm as well because it's, it is coherent. But we're going to spend a, uh, most of our time today looking at his knowledge. As we see from David, there's a psalm of King David, his knowledge is total. His knowledge is complete. He made everything. He breathed everything material into being, whispered or spoke it, commanded it, and there it is because he willed it and he spoke it into existence. He knows everything. <clears throat> David says, I am measurable. My days, my thoughts, my movements, he says, I'm finite. My boundaries can be traced because I, I 
can be put in a box. I am finite, but you, Yahweh, are immeasurable. Nobody can draw around the outlines. There is no boundary. He says, you're lofty. When I, when I hear the word lofty, I'm not thinking Mount Lofty. I'm thinking like, you can't, no matter how much you reach, no matter how, like what kind of ladder or rocket ship or whatever I, you know, however I can go, I can't ever go high enough to attain that knowledge or even understanding of that knowledge. It's too lofty. I am here, I'm finite, I'm knowable, I'm bounded. He is lofty, immeasurable. It tells us God learns nothing. God doesn't learn because he already knows everything. This is what Isaiah says of him. Who has directed the spirit of Yahweh? Or who has given him counsel? Who did he consult? When God was making decisions, who, who does he go to to ask? Oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? We love to offer God our suggestions. We like to sit in, in, in the seat of consultant. Hey, Lord, don't know if you know about this, but the best possible outcome of this situation is what I am now presenting to you. Please give me that thing. We love to sit in the seat of consultant of God, but who did he consult? These are all rhetorical questions, meaning nobody. Who gave him understanding and taught him the paths of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? No one. Look, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They consider it as a speck of dust on the scales. He lifts up the islands like fine dust. He's like, <clears throat> David says, I am measurable. I am bounded. I am finite. Isaiah goes further. goes, all the nations are dust. Every, everything in comparison. This is not a comparison of a candle to the sun. That is a comparison. These are incomparable things. Nobody has taught God anything. Nobody counsels God on anything because he knows everything. He knows everything. In part, one of the reasons is because he is everywhere, pervasive, Omnipresent is the theological term. He's everywhere. He knows everything and he is everywhere, which also speaks to his knowledge of everything because at once he's everywhere. David writes, where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? For go up to heaven, you are there. For make my bed in Sheol, if I die and go into the earth, you're there. If I fly, on wings of the dawn, so where the sun comes from, the east, you're there. Or if I settle down on the western horizon, you're there. Even there, your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold on to me. It says if I go high, if I go low, low if I go east, if I go west, to the highest of heaven, down into the grave, everywhere I could possibly go, you are there. And not only there, but you're leading me and guiding me. He goes on, even the darkness isn't dark to him. Nothing is hidden from him. He knows everything. His knowledge is complete. <clears throat> His knowledge is perfect. The darkness isn't dark to him. If I say, verse 11, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be my, will be my night. Even the darkness isn't, night to you, uh, isn't dark to you. The night shines like the day. The darkness and light are all alike to you. We can't disappear from God. You know, remember when you were a kid, you thought, if I cover my eyes... Because I can't see, nobody can see me. And this is kind of the dynamic we have with God where we try to hide things from Him. It's kind of like that three-year-old thinking, if I cover my eyes, I'm invisible. Same energy. Nothing is hidden from Him. The darkness is like light. When we want to hide something, when we want to obfuscate something, positive or, or negative, uh, we can hide it away. Put it in a safe, password protected file, hide it in the dark, bury it. What David's saying is, uh, God is already in all of those places. We can't hide anything from him. Can't escape from him. And again, if he is a malevolent force, not being able to escape from him is terrifying. If he is a loving force, 
not being able to go somewhere that he is not is wonderful. This gives us, I mean, perfect hope. There is nowhere God can't find you. In the depths of despair and depression, God is there with you. As you are sinning, willfully sinning, God is there with you. I know you have heard, depending on which kind of church you might have grown up in or people you listen to, you might hear, well, <clears throat> when you're sinning, uh, God turns his face away. Just like on the cross, the Father turns his face away. I know we sing that, but that's not actually what happened or what happens. You know, because the, one of the reasons that the perfect knowledge of God gives us perfect hope that there's nowhere God can't find us, is that God already knows everything that you're going to do. In fact, he knew that before you were born, and he knew that when Jesus came to bear the penalty for our sin, sin that we hadn't committed yet, so that one day we might be reconciled to God through Christ. So God already knows he knows what you're going through. He knows what you've done. Because his love, this is wonderful. It is also a warning. You know, it's, it's amazing. There's nowhere God can't find you. And it's a warning. There's nowhere God can't find you. We'll get back to that. His knowledge is intimate. It's personal. It's individual. This is what David's helping us understand. He says, you search me. You know my lying down. You know my comings and goings. You know my heart. God's knowledge of us is an abstract of us. Yes, God does know everything, but he also knows us intimately. So it's not just that he has this, this unlimited, infinite bank of knowledge, uh, but he actually knows you. He knows everything about you. That's when Scripture says he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows everything. He's not a distant God. Later on in the same psalm, David writes, God, how precious your thoughts are to me. How vast their sum is. For count of them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake up, I'm still with you. He knows his movements, knows his motives, knows his direction. Knows, his, knows your direction, knows your affections, knows your habits. He knows your location. Even after death, we don't like this, actually. In, in our flesh, at least, in the natural, we don't like this. The fact that God knows everything about us. Not just everything at like this high level, like how he created the universe and, and what we have done. He knows everything the intentions even of our heart. We like to keep things hidden. We like to keep things just to us, especially those things that we think, man, if, if, you knew, if you knew this about me, it would change your mind about me. Or if I could just keep this to myself and like project or magnify the things I think are good about me and minimize or obfuscate or hide the things, the sin that I struggle with, the flaws that I haven't yet overcome or will never overcome, uh, those, the, the secret things, if I could just hide them away, then I can be loved. People just know the good things about me and I can somehow cover over the bad things, then I can be loved, then I can be accepted, then I can belong. Well, that's backwards. It's backwards. We don't like, but yeah, we don't like being known. We like to protect the things that are ours and that we find secret. We, I don't know if you remember as a kid, uh, this is true in my family going on road trips. If I had a window seat, I didn't even like my siblings looking out my window. That's my window. You keep to your window. Poor youngest kid in the middle, where's he going to look? Uh, we don't like people looking into our stuff. We definitely don't like people looking into our life. 
and knowing our soul, like knowing the seat and sum of who we are, a motivation, a direction, a coming and going. The things that we think, and then we pass through the filter and we say something different. But if you knew what I thought, whoa, how could I be loved? David's saying, actually, you already know all of those things about me, God. And you hold on to me. You know everything about me. And you are still with me. This is true of you and me as well. He knows everything about you. We can only judge on the things that we see. We can only discern by the data or you know, material data that's presented to us, <clears throat> which is why it's a terrible idea for us to try to ascribe motivation to somebody else unless they tell us what their motivation is. It's a terrible idea because we're terrible at it to try to guess someone's motivation. We can really only discern what we can see, the activity. God looks straight to the heart. He knows everything about us, even our motivations, and still loves us. God makes perfect judgments. And you might think, you don't know what I've done. It is too great. It is too much. It's too bad. I can't be accepted by people. I can't be loved by God. It's too much. Uh, No, no. This is one of the reasons that having King David write this psalm is so amazing. Because when, you, when we survey, when we look at David's comings and goings, when we look at his motivations, sometimes they are incredibly wicked. And you see things like murder and envy. You see things like taking somebody else's wife. And he's the one who says, God, you know all of my motivations and you hold on to me. You won't let me go. It's the same for you and for me. Where can we go from his presence? Where can we hide from his spirit? Nowhere. He loves you. We can't go too far from his grace. His knowledge as well is inspirational, it leads us to action. In verse 22, David writes, Search me, God, know my heart. Test me and see my concerns. See if there's any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. Man, I love that. In fact, the whole first kind of, the whole chapter is is amazing. David calls upon God to search him. And I, I don't see a distinction between God's kind of passive knowledge and active knowledge, as if in his passive knowledge he knows everything, but then he can kind of zoom in on something. I think he knows everything always at the same time perfectly. And yet David says, "My life, even though he or, he's already identified, God already knows everything about me, David says, now in an active sense, with your knowledge of me, show me where I lack. Don't leave me in my squalor. Don't leave me in my sin. Don't leave me in my rebellion. Even though I know you already love me, help me to live in a way that is pleasing to you. David loves God. And David's knowledge of God's supreme knowledge, perfect, complete, total knowledge, leads him both to worship and to saying to God, help me, help me with that knowledge to live in a way that is pleasing to you. Search my life, weed out anything that's not from you or or for you or pleasing to you and lead me in your ways. David trusts God because God's judgments are perfect and all of his ways are just. And for us, we can trust God too. And the more we get to know about the omniscience of God, which is that theological term for he knows everything perfectly. When we consider that and think about it and meditate on it and live in light of it, it helps us to trust God because firstly, it means we don't need to know everything. Actually, it's incredibly liberating to know that God knows everything because we're always looking for a grown-up who, 
who knows what I'm supposed to do? I have these choices and it's not like I've got one good choice and one bad choice that's easy, but I might have like a bunch of really good choices. Which one should I do? Or I've only got a bunch of really bad choices. What should I do? And we have we heap this pressure on us because we're supposed to know. No, no, we're not supposed to know. David starts the psalm saying, I am finite and small. You are infinite and wondrous. Teach me your ways. Not, I'm supposed to have all the answers. No, I'm small and finite and bound. I go to the one who is not bound by by my knowledge. Go to the God who who knows everything. It's freeing to not have to know everything, folks. Secondly, Secondly, we have total confidence that he actually loves us. There is no imposter syndrome when you understand God knows everything and he loves you. Do you know what imposter syndrome is? It's usually in the workplace where you are, you're operating or promoted to a level that is beyond your competence and you're just waiting for someone to figure out that you don't know what you're doing. We don't have that in the kingdom when it comes to God's knowledge of us and his love for us. And there's no waiting for the other foot to drop no waiting for what we've hidden to become known and God for all of a sudden to say, whoa, if I had known that about you before, now this changes everything. There, there is none of that. It is amazing that God knows everything because it gives us confidence that he loves us. When David writes, you know everything about me, everywhere I go, you're there and you hold me. You keep me. It's the same for you. He knows everything about you and he loves you. There are no surprises for God. He learns nothing. He knows everything. Therefore, we have the greatest confidence that he loves us. Because he doesn't love some manufactured, projected version of yourself where you just highlight and magnify the things you think are good and pleasing and acceptable and hide away the things you think will make you unlovely. He actually knows all of that about you already. And he even says, bring, bring all of that into the light. Bring it all into the light. David says, anything I think is hidden away or that I don't even know about myself, bring that to light for me so that I can put to death the things of the flesh and walk in your ways. He knows everything about you and he loves you. This is what John writes. Even if my own heart condemns me, God doesn't. And he knows everything. Even when you're feeling, you're in the pit of despair. Oh my goodness, how did I do that? Why can't I overcome that? Even when my own heart condemns me, God doesn't. And he knows everything. And his judgments are perfect. I love how Paul puts it. He says, this is my paraphrase. I really don't care what you think about me. I don't even care what I have to say about me. I anchor all of my hope in what God says about me because he knows everything and his judgments are perfect. Mine are not, I'm unfallible, so I don't even trust my own heart. I trust his judgments, his ways are perfect. Man, it's wonderful. The all-powerful, all-knowingness of God. You can trust what he says about you. And lastly, we can obey him without agreeing. We can obey him without understanding. We can obey him taking the next step without even knowing where he's taking us ultimately because we can trust him because we know he's already there. Just like the darkness is like the light to him, the future is like the past to him. There are no secrets. He knows everything. He knows everything. If this is kind of a, if this is a jarring thought for you, perhaps your perspective of God is way too small. We don't worship this limited God who's learning. For him, the future is a mystery. The God of the universe is the all-knowing God. So we can 
act and come, we can obey knowing that he knows everything and that all of his ways are perfect and just. And we can come to understand as we grow and become more like Jesus. Or we may never get there in this lifetime, but we know that acting in obedience is the best next step because God does know everything and all his ways are perfect and just. Uh, I remember um, a couple of years ago, that Anthony playing piano today is back uh, on holidays from uh, interstate. Hey, Anthony. Highlight, Anthony. Um, <clears throat> and when he was doing his end of conservatorium recital on the piano, uh, we went along to, to cheer and support and whatnot. Uh, one of the songs he introduced, and he said, this song is incredibly difficult. And I'm thinking, man, all the songs he played are incredibly difficult. I said, this one is particularly difficult. And he said, it took me ages to memorize it and then a year to learn it. And I thought, hang on a second. You memorized it, but then it took you a year to learn it? How does that even work? I was thinking, man, this is, this is one of the things, or one of the ways that we approach the knowledge of God, where we can see what is what he's gifted to us, see what is written. And without understanding it even, we can already put it into practice. And as we trace over the life of Jesus with our lives, that's where we come to learn it as we see the perfect judgment of God outwork itself in our lives. We don't need to know the destination. I mean, ultimately, we already know the destination, but in our lifetime, We don't need the destination. We don't even need to know the step after the next step. We can be obedient in every aspect of our lives to the next step, knowing that God is already there in the future. He goes before us. Knowing that he is with us. Knowing that he is perfect and knows everything and all of his ways are just. My hope for us, as we go into 2023, is that our picture of God just becomes bigger and bigger, not because he is getting bigger and bigger, but just our understanding of him gets bigger and bigger. Man, if you can meditate on this, just one characteristic, one characteristic of God this week, he is omniscient. He knows everything and he knows everything about you. Everything about you. And he loves you and holds on to you. He loves you. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you again for these wonderful truths. And we echo David and say, search us, know our hearts, try us and know our thoughts. If there's anything grievous in us, find it and lead us in the way everlasting. Father, we just want to again declare your goodness uh, to us and over us. You, you're such a wonderful God. And not just wonderful to us, but you are wonderful in your own right. Perfect and just. See everything, know everything. And even though you know everything about us, you still love us. What a, I mean, in our flesh, this is a difficult thing for us to understand difficult thing for us to receive we know we can only really receive it by faith and say help us help us to know your knowledge by faith to receive your love to to stop lending our efforts to trying to cover up our sin or hide it or cover it in darkness but to bring it out into the light even though that doesn't seem right to us, but because we can trust you. Father, we know we can do this. Father, like we just spoke about before, help us to, to act in obedience and then see your work. Father, help us to be the kind of community where uh, we, ha- we have that kind of uh, 1 Corinthians 5 vision. We don't see Jesus the way we used to. We don't, view each other from an earthly perspective any longer. And so when 
we repent to others or when they repent to us or confess to us. Uh, we don't respond with a fleshly mindset, but we see things as you see them. Help us to hold on to each other out of love and to grow together in the knowledge of one another, even as we're growing together in the knowledge of you. I pray this in Jesus' name.